Hello and welcome to the show that I, your host, David Woodruff, lovingly call The Woodruff Report. Again, I'm your host, David Woodruff, and this is the first episode that I've recorded in two weeks. Last weekend, I missed our regular time. Usually, I record weekly on Fridays, Saturdays, weekend at some time. But a major event happened, and that was why I was unable to record. The soccer team that I am on currently won the state championship. So, obviously, that was calls for celebration. I couldn't be with you guys. I wanted to. I was longingly thinking of sitting at this desk and talking at you, giving you the best in sports reporting as I was celebrating with my friends. But then again, I wasn't really because we'd just accomplished something incredible. So I'm sorry that this is that I couldn't record last week, but I think I can make up for it with a great podcast this week. So what am I coming at you with? Well, I'm coming at you with a little bit of NFL Combine wrap-up. What are my thoughts on the NFL Combine? Who did well? Who didn't? Et cetera, et cetera. We've also got a little bit of NFL trades. Teams are shopping. Contenders are looking for people who can strengthen their rosters, while non-contenders are looking to get rid of some of their more notable players for draft picks and build towards the future. So we've got a little bit of NFL trade action. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about Champions League because second leg of a few of our games occurred during this past week and there were some stunning results look no further than the Barcelona PSG game. But listen on if you want to hear about any of that. I am your host, David Woodruff. This is the Woodruff Report and we are coming at you in three, two, one. The NFL Combine affectionately referred to as the Underwear Olympics, occurred last week at beautiful Lucas Oil Stadium, and what a combine it was. We saw the fastest 40 ever run, and we just generally saw some of the best athletes in the world with one another try to get reps, get fast. The combine is just a great place if you want to see some of the best athletes in the world. We've generally seen these NFL players getting bigger and faster and just more and more athletic as the years have gone by, and this year was no different. So I have to say before I start that I am not the biggest fan of the NFL Combine. What do I like about the NFL Combine? I like that the best and brightest of the college, of college football all can come together so that all 32 teams can evaluate them. I love the fact that teams are able to interview players because, as we know, football is very much mental. It's almost as mental as it is physical because all the film and preparation that goes to it is almost as important as the product on the field. Look no further than the Patriots. They don't have some of the crazy biggest, fastest players in the league, but their preparation has allowed them to be contenders. Oh, and someone named Tom Brady. But... I love the fact that teams are able to interview players, and I like the fact that you're able to see a baseline. How fast is someone compared to other people? How many reps can someone lift compared to other people? So it just kind of gives you a baseline. So is this guy going to be super strong? Is this guy going to be super fast? Stuff like that. It's very general. What I don't like about it is that often it doesn't actually simulate NFL-style movement really i mean the broad jump it it like what what's really the point of the broad jump when are nfl players going to be jumping as far as they possibly can and really nfl players don't really jump that much so it kind of seems a little old fashioned in the way uh one of my favorite examples is offensive linemen running the 40 so the only time an offensive lineman would ever actually run the 40 is when they're going to celebrate with a teammate after a long touchdown. And I mean, you're not going to draft someone because when your player scores a touchdown, he can get down the field super fast and go celebrate with him. What's the point of having offensive linemen run the 40? So generally, I don't think the combine does a very good job of simulating game-like situations. But it does give you a baseline, and it's generally fun to watch. It's always fun to compare these NFL players to each other. So what were some of the highlights of the combine? One was John Ross 
the Washington Husky running a 4-2-2 40-yard dash, the fastest ever run. Absolutely incredible. And there was some indication that this man was going to be a speedster coming in. He was the guy that many experts were tipping to break the record if anybody was going to. So congratulations to John Ross on an incredible 40-yard dash. And that'll definitely uh, boost his draft stock because a lot of teams... Every NFL team wants a speedster that can take the top off a of defense and make safety help be on him all the time. So, John Ross, congratulations. You just boosted your draft stock. Another thing about the combine that I failed to mention before is that it can give notoriety to players who weren't really getting it before. Players that played in mid-conferences or weren't on national TV every day. One great example of this was Obi Melifonwu. Lo siento if I butchered that name, but he's a safety out of UConn. I personally don't see UConn games on ESPN every weekend, but he had the best broad jump and the best vertical jump. And although I did state before that I don't think broad jump and vertical jump are really the best way of measuring people, the fact that he was the best at these two categories will get his name out there. Teams will be like, wow, this guy's an athletic freak. Let's look at his tape again. And whenever you can get NFL organizations to look at your tape again or evaluate you again, it's very, it's very good. I mean, what's the worst that, that could happen? I haven't really heard of someone being like, oh, we're going to draft some guy. He had a great vertical jump. Uh, we're not going to draft him anymore. It can only help your stock. He's getting his name out there, and he's kind of from a mid-major conference that's not on national TV every day. So congratulations, Obi, on your vertical jump and your broad jump. And I hope that it boosts your draft stock. In the end, I want all these guys to get drafted. So congratulations, Obi. And that's a thing that I really like about the Combine. Another very important thing that occurs every year at the Combine is seeing how those star players in college fare. So coming into the Combine, we were all looking forward to seeing Christian McCaffrey and Leonard Fournette, Mitch Trubisky, all these star players out of college who are tipped to go high in the draft. Go. So how did these men... these do well Leonard Fournette showed that he is just an absolute tank running a 4 5 40 and at his at his mass basically he's a big dude to be able to run a 4 5 if I was an NFL if I was an NFL defender I would not want that guy running at me 4 5 speed with that much muscle on him ooh man I'm just gonna get run over McCaffrey also ran, ran a, a very good 40, so nothing really notable. I mean, all these players did well. Trubisky is still expected to be the first quarterback selected in the draft. Kaiser also is up there, Deshaun Kaiser. Uh, McCaffrey showed that he's a Swiss Army knife. He can do it all. Fournette showed that he's an absolute beast and why teams are definitely going to look at him in, in the top rounds. So I do want to end with this. Ways to improve the combine. Because, as I mentioned before, I am not the biggest fan. What are three ways that the combine can be improved? Well, for one, more technology should be used. I think virtual reality is an absolute, absolutely perfect piece of equipment for the combine. Because you are able to simulate game situations... By putting on that headset, you transport yourself into an actual game to see how a player will react under the stress of the NFL. The game speeds up as you move from college to professional, and so many college players just aren't ready to make that next step. So seeing how a player will react in game situation is, is an absolutely vital piece of information. And if I was an NFL team, I would be chomping at the bit to get this information. My second piece of advice to improve the combine would be, this is sort of a small thing, but I think it would be interesting, have players run the 40 with a football in their hand. I talked a lot about this before, that the combine doesn't simulate game situations, and the only time that a player is really running a 40 without a ball in their hand is when they're running a route, and that's only really applicable to a wide receiver. So especially running backs, they should be running with the ball in their hand at all times, because that's what it's going to be like in the NFL. And if you want to simulate, if you want to see what 
a player is going to be like, you should put them in that environment. In a game, a running back's not going to be running down the field full speed without a ball in his hand. Although it will damage speeds a little bit, that's not a big deal because the combine, as much as it's advertised and stuff, it's not a PR stunt. It's for, pl- it's for teams to evaluate players en masse, where they can see them all and compare them to one another. Finally, my last piece of advice for the NFL Combine is, again, something to do with technology. I think every player should be measured. Now, I'm not a technology expert, but I've heard of technology like this. They should have sensors all over their body to see their mechanics. How are their muscles working? How much do they use their legs when they're jumping, their arms? When they're running, what are their running mechanics? Are they good or bad? Because I think that this is very good when it comes to injury prevention. If you see how a guy, at the combine, players are moving and running as fast as they possibly can. And they're under stress, just like they would be in an NFL game because they've got all these scouts watching them. So... When a player is running under stress with people watching them, how will they respond? Are, will they develop some mess up in their running mechanics that could possibly lead to injury, torn hamstring? Maybe they don't use their arms enough. Maybe they, when they're running super fast, they lean a little bit to, a, to the side. Obviously, I'm not a physical movements expert, so these are all hypothetical situations. But I think that by censoring these players up, you can definitely help medical teams assess if a player is injury prone or not before you draft them. After all, no one wants to draft that guy who tears his ACL on the first day of spring camp because then you just get nothing. So that's the combine. Very interesting. Great to see the players go against each other. Uh, One final thought is that Miles Garrett absolutely killed the combine and coming away with it, he has to be the first selection. If the Browns don't pick Miles Garrett, if I was a Cleveland fan, I would move to Hawaii. I don't know, because I'd just be I'd just be in so much shock and denial. So let's move on. Let's stay in the National Football League, but let's move on to all the trade rumors. And a lot of stuff happened this past week. Bunch happened in the NFL. So I'm kind of going to go through it. And this is more about quantity, not quality. So I'm going to tell you all that happened, not really go into a bunch of detail. Matt Barkley is now a 49er. I'm a big 49er fan, so it's great to have a USC guy. Go Trojans, by the way. If you didn't know I was a Trojans fan, huge Trojans fan. Great to have a USC quarterback in the city by the bay. So congratulations, Matt Barkley. Logan Ryan is now a Tennessee Titan. The corner for the Patriots made the move to Tennessee, and that's really what Tennessee needed to address in the offseason, their secondary. This team's very good. Great, great young quarterback, great offensive line, and they just need that secondary that I think will push them over the edge and allow them to compete in the division. Brock Osweiler is gone. He is out of Texas. His brief stint with the Texans ended as the Browns now own his contract. That's an important thing to know. They do not own him. They own his contract, which means that they can release him for a couple of draft picks, which many experts believe they will do. So the fall of Brock Osweiler has been tremendous. That huge contract from Houston, and now it looks like he's going to be released by Cleveland for a couple of mid-round draft picks. Mike Glennon, the perennial backup quarterback, is now a Chicago Bear, and he's actually making, making an exorbitant amount of money for how good a player he is. I mean, he's proven that he can't really lead a winning team. But Chicago paid the money, and the quarterback market is always inflated. So Mike Glennon is now a Chicago Bear. A huge trade for the Philadelphia Eagles, who signed Alshon Jeffrey, the tremendously talented Chicago Bears wide receiver, to a one-year deal. And he is a weapon that is going to be indispensable this coming year for um, second-year quarterback Carson Wentz. Alshon Jeffrey had a had a up and down season with Chicago. He was suspended. He never really had Cutler couldn't throw the ball to him that much. He just it was never going to work in Chicago. And Philadelphia did not have the wide receiving core that Carson Wentz needed. So it'll be interesting to see how the big man does in Philadelphia. Great move for the Eagles. An even better move when it comes to wide receiver occurred when Redskins wide receiver Deshaun Jackson moved to the Buccaneers. Man, Deshaun Jackson and Mike Evans on one team, 
Jameis Winston must just have his mouth watering right now. I mean, he's got one of the fastest, best deep threat players in the game in new acquisition to Sean Jackson, and we all know how good Mike Evans is. Stephen Gilmore, the Bills cornerback, is now a Patriot. The Patriots don't usually go after big marquee free agents such as Stephen Gilmore, but he's now a Patriot. It'll be interesting to see what Belichick does with this kind of talent. Kenny Britt, the mediocre Rams wide receiver, is now a Brown. I don't really have much to say about this. I mean, great. It happened. Russell Okung, the Broncos tackle, is now a Charger. And the Chargers really need to upgrade their offensive line. That's something that, they, that was lacking last year. They needed protection for Phillip Rivers. And Okung is a proven, proven big old guy who can really... I don't know if he's going to protect Rivers blindside, but he can. Torrey Smith, I love you, man. Long time. Well, not long time, but 49er is now an eagle. And really, it's the best thing that could have happened to him. The quarterback situation in San Francisco has, has been dismal the last few years. I'll get, I'll talk a little bit more about the 49ers quarterback situation later. But no one's really been able to throw down the field to him. He's a bona fide deep threat. The Eagles get another terrific down the field threat to pair with Alshon Jeffrey and what's become a scary wide receiver's corpse. All the best, Torrey Smith. So that's really my... Um, roundup of what happened. One last thing, Martellus Bennett, the talented tight end of the Patriots, is now a Packer. One more weapon for Aaron Rodgers to use. So a bunch went down, and we're only a couple days into free agency and trades, and there's a lot going down. I would like to talk a minute about Kirk Cousins. Kirk Cousins was signed to a franchise tender, which allows the Redskins to now shop for trades. And Cousins has now said that he will be a 49er either in 2017 or 2018. As a Niner fan, I am ecstatic. I really want Cousins to come to the city by the bay, play at Levi Stadium. I, this will really restore hope in the franchise if this man comes. All the futility that, that Jed York and Trent Baalke facilitated will be thrown out the window. This man is a bona fide starting quarterback in the Q, in the National Football League. He's put up huge numbers these last two years for the Redskins. And under Shanahan, I am just excited to see what he can do. So the trade hasn't it's, it's been a very weird period of time. There have been experts saying, oh yeah, he's definitely going to go to the 49ers. But the Redskins really have been reluctant to bargain. They've said, oh, no, we're not going to trade him. They haven't given him that long-term extension that he desired. So there's a lot of questions going around about this deal. But he has said that he is going to be a Niners quarterback in 2017 or 2018. So the future looks bright at the quarterback position for the 49ers. Which means what weapons are the 49ers going to get for him? They've already made the acquisition of Pierre Garçon, the longtime Reds, Redskins wide receiver who Cousins threw to a lot. So is this a sign? I don't know. They went and got Garçon. Is this another piece that they can maybe use to try to attract Cousins over? I am excited. We'll kind of wait and see how this plays out. But this is potentially a blockbuster move. I think that if the 49ers are, manage to trade for Kirk Cousins, it will be the biggest move of the entire offseason, and it will vault the 49ers from possibly worst team in the NFL to maybe even a poss possibility to win the division. So I'm very excited to see how this plays out. Stay tuned for more. I might even call an emergency Woodruff report if the 49ers sign Kirk Cousins. That's how excited I will be. Before I end the show, I do want to talk about the Champions League. And game two of some of the round of 16 fixtures occurred. So Tuesday of last week, Real Madrid played Napoli and Bayern played Arsenal. And it turned out to be a mirror image of what happened in the first leg. Real Madrid went to Naples and came out with a 3-1 win. Again, after going behind, Ramos, Sergio Ramos, the big center back for, for Real scored two goals, and then Morata finished it off on a tap-in to make it 3-1, and the holders are through. In Arsenal, 
It was a very sad day for Arsenal fans. And it might be the beginning of the end for longtime manager Arsene Wenger. A 5-1 defeat at the hands of Bayern Munich ended their chances of qualifying for the next round again. And the game actually started out pretty promising for Arsenal. I mean, they were down 5-1 from the first leg, but Walcott scored in the 20 something minute to make it 1-0. But Koscielny got a red card while giving away a penalty to Robert Lewandowski of Bayern, and it all went downhill as... Arsenal surrendered five straight goals and another just absolute trounce of Arsenal at the hands of Bayern. 10-2 on aggregate was the final. And embarrassing. Arsenal fans can't be happy with this, and it'll be interesting to see how Wenger's future plays out after this embarrassment. On day two, Barcelona hosted PSG and Dortmund hosted Benfica. I'll start with Dortmund and Benfica. Benfica was holding a slim 1-0 lead after their win in Portugal on match day one, but they could not hold it as Dortmund came out as 4-0 winners over a Benfica side that really was, was pressing their luck to beat one of the best teams in Europe in front of their home fans at the Signal Iduna Park. But talk about getting overshadowed. The Barcelona PSG game turned out to be an all time classic. So, Barcelona was down 4 0 after the first leg after suffering one of their most humiliating defeats in as far back as anybody can remember. So, after their game in Paris, they did not give up hope, and boy, were they rewarded with a 6 1 win, absolutely breaking the heart of PSG of Cavani and Co. They, they just looked absolutely awesome unbelievable. They were motivated. They were quick. They were fast. The passing tempo was all there. They quickly went up 1-0, then 2-0, then 3-0 before PSG looked like they put away the nail in the coffin of Barcelona by scoring one back. Cavani with a volleyed shot into the roof of the net made it 3-1. Thus, Barcelona needed three more goals in the last 20 minutes of the match to move on. And Neymar scored a free kick with about 10 minutes left to make it 4-1. Then, just before stoppage time, another goal, 5-1. And then five or six minutes into injury time, the Catalan club scored again to make it 6-1. Scenes around the camp now as the fans were going crazy. Luis Enrique, the manager, was going crazy. The players were going crazy. And it, virtu- and it ended up to be virtually the last kick of the game as the referee blew the whistle almost directly after. Hearts broken in Paris, but absolute scenes in Barcelona as the European dynamites move on. They look to be a favorite going on after what we just witnessed in the last game. So I did want to talk a little bit about the Champions League, about that game. I suggest watching a recap of that game just because it's, it's tough to, to say in words the emotions that were being felt on the field and what was going on in that game. So this has been the Woodruff Report, and I have been your host, David Woodruff. We talked a little bit about the NFL Combine, I told you what I thought about it and a a few improvements that I think could be made to it. Then we talked about the latest trades and rumors in the NFL, as we're just a couple days into free agency and trading and such. And then we finished with a little bit of Champions League recap. I'm so thankful for you sticking with me, even though I did not podcast last week. This is my first podcast in two weeks. Thanks for sticking with me. Thanks for being loyal. I've been your host, David Woodruff. This is the Woodruff Report. See you guys next week. Thanks for listening.